أشرف المرسلين وعلى آله وصحابه أجمعين أما بعد. So today we continue with the sects that we have been studying to two very very well known and important sects. The first we will be doing is the Maturudiya and the Maturudiya which the people who follow are called Maturudi is a sect that a large portion of the Muslim Ummah ascribes themselves to without knowing much about it. Maturidi is a madhab that was named after a man named Abu Mansur Muhammad Al Maturidi Al Samarqandi. Al Maturidi is ascribing himself to Maturid, which is a place near Samarqand today in Uzbekistan. He was a man that died in 333 Hijri. So even though he's from the early part, but he's not from the first three generations as some people have claimed. He was an Imam from the Imams of Ahlul Kalam or the people of the Ulema of Kalam. As his followers, they themselves, in praising him, call him the Imam of the Mutakallimin, the people of Kalam. The Maturidi Aqeedah is close to the Ashari Aqeedah. The Ashaira, their Aqeedah and that of the Maturudiya is very close. There are some differences and there are about 12 that have been pointed out, but they're all within the realm of their use of Kalam. And I was going to discuss the differences, but in reality, they are of no benefit to the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Because the differences between them are not even agreed upon between them. <laughs> like if you ask somebody who is Ashari, the Ashaira, they will put forward different differences. <laughs> and the Maturidi will put forward different differences. So, <laughs> We don't even know exactly where they stand on a lot of these things. But the Maturidi, like the Ashaira, they believe in only some of the Sifat. Some of them in their books, like al Nasafi, which is their standard text to study in Aqeedah, have mentioned eight. They only believe in eight. Ilm and Basira and Sama' and some of these like this. But if you talk about Nuzul or anything Fi'liya, they don't believe in it. They make ta'wil of it. They are from the people of Kalam, the people of uh, philosophy, the people who use this rhetorical debate and the same kinds of things that we discussed about the Ashaira. Now, when we talk about their bid'ah, you can go down the same line as that of the Ashaira because they follow the same type of pattern of use of Kalam. They became widespread in the later times, in the time of the Abbasiyya, especially when there were debates between the Jahmiya and the Mu'tazila. Even though, if you look at the works of those early ulema who refuted them, they find that they took a lot of the Jahmi's thought. They took a lot from the Jahmiya, even though they used to debate with them. One of the very uh, beneficial quotes that I found and this is from a scholar who I had alhamdulillah the sharf or the honor to sit in his durus I won't call him my teacher because just because you sit in somebody's durus it doesn't make them your teacher but he was a, a well-known scholar his, he has written probably the best work that I have read discussing the Maturidi Aqeedah and this is a doctor a sheikh Allama Shamsuddin al-Afghani a Salafi rahmatullah alayhi and he was a, a well-known scholar who wrote his master's thesis about the Maturidi Aqeedah and it was printed in Saudiya and he won many awards for it and he was uh, he used to live in Peshawar in Pakistan and he used to teach there and also in Saudiya and the madrasa he started madrasa Thariya is still there in Peshawar from his writing I will summarize a few beneficial points one of the things he said that the Maturudiyya and the Sha'ira, both of them were from Ahlul Kalam, yani the people of Kalam, and they developed Ilmul Kalam 
as a attempt to reconcile between kalam and the asma or sifat that the salaf believed in. So they, in a way, they were trying to do something good. They were trying to refute some of these sects that came out with bid'at and wanted to refute them in debates. But the Maturidi as the Asha'ira, they both fell into the trap of using ilm al-kalam in trying to use these debates. So in the end, they started to go away from ithbat, from the Quran, from the Kitab and Sunnah and delving in philosophy and using that to justify their debates. And even today when you go to their madaris and I sat in some of their durus to learn what they had to be able to refute them properly. And when I sat in them, they themselves did not understand what they were saying. When you would ask them questions, they would, they would just say, you know, this is what we believe. This is what we are taught. This is our madhab. This is our way. And that's it. And when you would bring up quotes from even Abu Hanifa rahmatullahi himself, because most of the Maturidis, they are followers in fiqh of Abu Hanifa. But when you bring the quotes from the Imam himself condemning ilm al-kalam, or from the imma of the Ahnaf like Abu Yusuf and others, they will themselves say that we are Hanafi in fiqh, but not in aqidah. In aqidah, we're maturidi. And that's amazing, because if you, if you love uh, Imam Abu Hanifa so much, you should follow him in his aqidah. The Asha'ira are the same way. Most of the Asha'ira that you find today are either in Maliki-dominated countries or Shafi'i-dominated countries. And in those countries, when you ask them about the, the clear quotes from Imam Shafi'i, condemning ilm al-kalam, they will say we are shafi'i in fiqh, but we are ashari in aqidah. If they love Imam shafi'i so much, why don't they follow him in aqidah? The same thing with Imam Malik and his quotes to condemn ilm al-kalam and the use of it in aqidah are very clear and many. And his ifbat of the sifat of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and nuzul and istawa are clear. So then they will say we are maliki in fiqh, in ashari in aqidah. And this is a mistake. We need to follow those imma from the Salaf, from the early generations, in their fiqh and in their aqidah. And this is something we find from the Maturidis, that they were debated, and there are many instances of the Asha'ira and them losing debates to the Hanabila, who were those protecting the aqidah of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah at the time. But they gained uh, a great presence in the time of uh, the Abbasiyya and then later during the Khilafah Uthmaniyya during the time of the Ottoman Empire they were the official Aqidah and they were used to be in every place where they had the Ottomans had the influence they were forced upon them in fiqh the Hanafi fiqh and in Aqidah the Maturidi Aqidah and then in Qiraat the Qiraat of Hafs and Asim and that's why you see this dominance of these around the world but, alhamdulillah, uh, many of the Ahnaf and others, like Abu Liz al-Hanafi and others, they stood up against this and they made rud of them. And alhamdulillah, you see their presence today declining. Even in those countries where they had a, a you could say, a monopoly before, is declining. It is enough to make rud on them to say that they use ilm al-kalam in aqidah. And we already discussed the condemnation of that, so there's no reason to go over it again. The next sect and the one that I want to focus on today, which is very important for us to understand, is the Bataniya. The Bataniya is a Rafidi Sufi sect. Yani, they were from the Rafidi in Aqidah and they ascribed themselves to the Sufiya, to the Sufi Tariqat. And during the Khilafah of Ma'mun, the son of Harun al Rashid, they developed. The Bataniya comes from the Arabic word of Batin, meaning hidden. And this is something that is not finished. The Bataniya, and when I'm going to talk about this, you will be surprised at some of it. But I want you to understand that there are still large groups of people that ascribe themselves to this sect. So the Bataniya, they claim to have hidden knowledge that nobody else knew about. And they said there is a Zahir. And this is why many times those 
who follow the correct aqidah, people call them dahiri. There's a madhab in fiqh, it's called dahiri, after Dawood of dahiri Ibn Hazm was upon that madhab and others. This is something different. That's a madhab in fiqh. This is an accusation made against the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah when they want to stick to the text of the Kitab and Sunnah. They say, oh, you are Zahir. You just look at the Zahir of it. And they feel that they have the Batani ilm. They have some secret ilm. When they mean this, what do they mean? And this is from their own writings. As Shaykh al-Islam, Taqiyuddin ibn Taymiyyah and others showed from their own writings to make rad of them. They said that the Qur'an has an apparent meaning that the masses they take and has a hidden meaning that only they know. And a part of their aqidah is deception and nifaq. Yani the taqiyah to lie, to deceive the Muslim masses and nifaq to have hypocrisy in front of the people. They try to build good relations. If you meet one of them, they will, they will lie about their aqai. But their books are clear and when you sit with them privately, you will know what their real beliefs are. And if they find somebody that they want to influence and they take them to the side and then they open up to their batin or their inner secrets. One of their aqaid that Imam al-Ghazali, and we'll discuss Imam al-Ghazali and his experience with bataniya in a little, by, a little bit, that he exposed, is they, in their writing, they've written, that what is meant by adab in the Qur'an or an ahadith, like when we talk about adab al-qabr or adab al-nar, they don't believe that this, what is meant by it, is something in the akhirah. Now this is serious, you're paying attention. They write that adab, when referring to the Qur'an and sunnah, is referring to Muslims that busy themselves with salah and siyam and hajj and jihad. <laughs> so the Muslim is busy with salah, and siyam, and making hajj, and performing jihad, they said, this is adab. Allah has put them in adab. <laughs> and they said that these are zahir, but they believe in the batin meaning, the batin meaning of these things. This is from their own works. As Imam al-Ghazali exposed, and al taqyuddin ibn Taymiyyah and others have exposed. What do they believe? Salah, when you talk about salah, you know salah, when we read about Aqim al-Salah in the Qur'an or the Khimsa Salawat in Ahadith, we believe in the way that Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made the Salah. They believe no. Salah means following their leaders. Salah is not the five times Salawat or Qiyam al-Layl or Eid or Jum'ah. Salah means to follow their leaders. They do not believe in a physical Salah. SubhanAllah. Siyam. What does siyam mean? We take, as the brothers and sisters who are fasting today and tomorrow for the Ashura or in Ramadan, to make imsak from the time of Fajr has entered till Maghrib, from eating and drinking and other things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and the Prophet وسلم, have forbidden. But they say no, that you can eat and drink in Ramadan. The Bataniya, they believe you can eat and drink in Ramadan, they say, that the siyam is contemplating the hidden meanings of the Qur'an. And the imsak is from anything that distracts you from the hidden meanings. <laughs> so if somebody is telling you, you need to make salah, and this is the ahkam of salah, they say, we have to make siyam from this. <laughs> hajj. We believe, ahl sunnah wal jama'ah, that hajj, in the mawsam al-hajj, in the time that Allah wants to prescribe for hajj, when we go to Mecca and go through the rituals of Muzdalifa, Arafah before that, and then the Jamarat and the Tawaf, and this is what we believe Hajj is. In the way that the Prophet ﷺ showed it, in the time that the Prophet ﷺ showed it, in the way that the Prophet ﷺ made it. They say no, Hajj means to travel to visit their leaders. Their leaders... When you travel to visit them, this is Hajj. It has nothing to do with Mecca or the season of Hajj. Zakat. We believe in paying Zakat, Zakat al-Mal being 2.5% on your wealth that your year has spent with you. Then there's Zakat on, on other things as well. And, and we know that it has been prescribed in the Quran on the wealth 
that has to be paid and we know how the Prophet وسلم, showed us and how the Sahaba عنهم, paid it. That's what we believe the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah. They believe that zakat is to pay money to their leaders. <laughs> zakat doesn't go to the poor. It goes to their leaders. Zina. I think those who need to know what zina is, know what zina is and know that it's haram. They believe that zina is to disclose the evils and misbehaviors of their leaders. <laughs> so if their leaders do evil things, bad acts, anything, Catholic priest stuff, then to disclose that, that's zina. <laughs> and to hide it, then this is you're preserving yourself from zina. And adultery is halal for them. The Bataniya believe there is no Salah in the way that we believe in Salah. No Siyam in the way that we believe in Siyam. No Hajj, no Zakah, and Zina is Jaiz. Hence, the Muslims have come to an ijma, the consensus of the Muslim Ummah, that they are Kafir. And this consensus was recorded by Shaykh al-Islam, Taqyuddin ibn Taymiyyah, and others. The Bataniya allow other things like incest and the Amal of Qawm al and I will not go into depth of that. One of their interesting characteristics, and this is something Imam al-Ghazali and Ibn Taymiyyah and other ulama have recorded. And Imam al-Ghazali, he spent a lot of time with them. In fact, he followed them for a part of his life to learn about them and then he made a rad of them having spent time with them. So they opened up to him about a lot of things that they wouldn't open up to others about. And then he recorded from their writings and made rad of them. So one of their interesting, and this has been recorded in many books, is they believe in aqal ala al-naqal, like they as the people of Kalam and others, that they believe in their own logic over the Qur'an and Sunnah. But they take it to an extreme to say, that according to Bataniya, it is afdal, it is mustahab for a man to marry his sister over anybody else. Na'udhu billah. Na'udhu billah. They believe this is better. Why? Even the Quran and Ahadith and, and the ijma of the Muslim ummah, this is haram, mutlaqan, and anybody with any fitrah and logic and sense will know it's haram. But the Bataniya said this is even not just halal, but it's better. Why? They said because logically, she knows you better than some stranger. She knows your likes and dislikes. And this, for those brothers and sisters and watching who don't understand well, why we push the issue of following the kitab and sunnah and not relying upon our own opinions, this should be a lesson for you to see that when you let your self go from the obedience of the kitab and sunnah and you go towards this following your own desires it leads a person so astray that even anybody who may not even be a muslim but has some idea of decency will say that they're wrong they dismissed the sharia altogether hudud salah hajj everything in the Sharia, they dismissed it saying that there is a hidden meaning. So they left all of it. And that is why, unlike the Asha'ira or the Maturidiya, we don't, we don't make excuses for them. But the Asha'ira and the Maturidiya, we don't make takfir on them. Maybe some of them have gone to the level of kufr, And some of them have not. From the Asha'ira and the Maturidiya, some of them are still Muslim. Alhamdulillah, we don't make takfir. But the Bataniya or the Ijma of the Ummah or Kuffar. The Bataniya split into many other sects. One of them is called Ismailiya or Ismailiyun. They are still well known today. One is called the Durz or the Druz. And then there is the Alawi as those uh, people today. <laughs> I won't mention names. You know. Maybe a leader of some Middle Eastern country who follows this religion is there today and they are there. Maybe a little bit north of Jordan, maybe a little west, anyway. So, those people are there today and they hold these beliefs and many of our, may Allah guide our brothers, some of them, 
They call them Waliul Amr and they call them Khulafa and they say that they are the leaders of the Muslims. So you should know what their aqidah is and then see if we can call them Waliul Amr. So, and these are all botany sects. Ismailis, the Druze, the Alawis are all sects within the Bataniya. The Ismailiya were Rafada, they were Shi'i. And then they went further and they split from the other Shi'i. And this split happened after Jafar al-Sadiq when the, when the 12 Imams of the Shi'i were being discussed. The Ithna Ashr, they believed in Musa al-Khadim to be the next Imam while the Ismailis believed in Ismail ibn Jafir to be the next Imam. That's where they got the name Ismaili. But the Ismailis, they went further. They went further to go into the botany sect of the Shi'i. And the botany, as I said, were Rafidi, they were Shi'i. So there was the original Rafidah, and then they split Ithna Ashar, and we'll discuss Ithna Ashar later, and other sects from them. But the Bataniya were one of their sects who mixed the Sufi ideology and the Shi'i ideology, which has been mixed a lot, which are very close. And then they developed a further decline into the botany ideology and they started to take money of zakah and give it to their leaders. And they, they believed that the Mahdi reincarnates himself every generation into their leader who today they call Agha Khan. Agha Khan. And Agha Khan is a title that goes from person to son to son to son. And today, the Agha Khan today is one of the richest men in the world. And it is well known about their beliefs, the Ismaili beliefs, and Agha Khan and his beliefs. And the ulema who have studied their belief across the board have made takfir on them, have called them kafir. And that's why even the government of Saudi does not allow them to come for Hajj. Because the Qadianis and the Ismailis were not given the visas for Hajj because they were not considered as Muslims. And these people, their leaders, the Aga Khans, you can Google them, you can look them up. They throw lavish parties with alcohol and, and, and pork and, and dignitaries. And they're, and they're, it's well known, you can Google pictures of it. And these are supposed to be reincarnations of Mahdi <laughs> This is how misguided this sect is. The Druze, another botany sect, who appeared to be Muslim on the outside, and they claimed great love for the Ahlul Bayt, but then during a, a time when the man who they are named after Abu Abdullah Muhammad bin Ismail ad durz He became very close to Al-Hakim who was an Ismaili Shi'i Fatimid ruler of Egypt. As we see Egypt today, Alhamdulillah, a country that is following in essence, at least the people, the Aqeedah of the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah. Even if there is a great influence of the Sha'ara and things there. But in essence, they do, alhamdulillah. But that wasn't always the case. Egypt was ruled by Fatimid, Ismaili, Shi'i rulers who were Ismaili Rafidas. And from them was Al-Hakim. But it wasn't enough for Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Ismail al-Durzi. He went to Al-Hakim and he said that I want to start a new sect, a botany sect. And we want you to be called the Ilah, na'udhu billah. And he started to say to the people that na'udhu billah, and we ask refuge in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for what they say. We have to study their batil aqidah, otherwise, wallahi, our tongues don't want to bring these words. They claimed, and we ask Allah's refuge from what they say, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reincarnated himself into Ali ibn Talib. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu. Now people with these kinds of belief that are governing countries, people are telling us that they're Walul Amr. So they believe that 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reincarnated himself in Ali ibn Abi Talib and then into the generations of Ali ibn Abi Talib meaning his children from their children from their children until Al-Hakim and Al-Hakim should be given full authority obeyed like the Quran is obeyed and worshipped Na'udhu Billah and Daud uh, Al-Durzi he himself he started to say that I am a reincarnation of the Prophet Al-Hakim is a reincarnation of Allah and I am a reincarnation of the Prophet not and it was very evident to the awam even that Islam doesn't have the concept of reincarnation this is a Hindu concept we don't have it in Islam Alhamdulillah but this bottle sect it started to spread until the people they realized what he is saying and the ulema and many brave ulema stood up against the Fatimids and they attacked uh, Durzi and he went to Al-Hakim and he asked for permission and help Al-Hakim supported him and gave him money to go to Sham and al Durzi he went to Sham and he started to spread his religion there it is not a religion that has anything to do with Islam even if you use the name of Islam until today there is Durz the Druze are there in Palestine you will find them in uh, uh, Lebanon you will find them in other countries in the Middle East you will find them even when I went to Venezuela we found them there from the people that had migrated there from Sham and they are active and we as Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah should know their Aqeedah to be careful about them and to give da'wah to them and to refute them for their bid'at. one of the things that's clear that is against the Aqeedah of the Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah that they believe in is reincarnation and then they are also botany so they don't believe in regular salah the Druze as they write they don't believe in salah or siyam or anything being fard on you until you're 40 <laughs> and then when you're 40 what becomes fard on you is not the regular salah it is a botany salah it's a hidden salah now they also believe in taqiyya which is the hypocrisy and concealing like the other rafida they believe that their leaders are uh, ma'asum they are protected from anything they cannot make a mistake now when I mention these things I think to all of you here and every Muslim watching online will know that this is batal this is falsehood but what's important for us is to be careful not to go down the path of misguidance that the bataniya went down because even many of our Muslim brothers what when we tell them that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says this in the Quran they say well this is a dahir of it but there is a batin of it and we tell them that stick to the kitab and the sunnah they say that you are wahhabiyya and dahiriyya and this and that and that and they start going down that same path and many of the Muslims who have been misguided and gone down the path of a Sufiya and tasawwuf and things they have also gone down the same thing where they believe there is a batin way of making dhikr and there is a hidden way and only our shiyukh know them and we tell them that these adhkar you make where are they in the sunnah they say no 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 they are not in your zahir sharia they are in a hidden sharia which is the same misguidance that the bataniya went to and that will lead a person to kufr I'm not saying that everybody who goes down that path is kafir but it will lead them if you keep going down that path like the Bataniya so the Ahl Sunnah wal Jama'ah we believe in the Quran as it is in the way that the Prophet Sallallahu explained it so when the Quran ordered us to make Salah how did the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam make Salah? he made Qiyam, he made Ruku, he made Sujood he made Takbirat, he read the Quran the five time Fard Salawat and then the Sunan that are mentioned in Sahih Ahadith this is what we believe when the Prophet Sallallahu showed us to fast on Ashura or on Arafah or on Mondays and Thursdays, this is what we do. How do we fast? The way the Prophet Sallallahu showed us. There is no bath anyway. There is a zahir of what the Prophet Sallallahu did and that's what Ahlul Sunnah wal Jama'ah we follow. And that, the askar that the Prophet Sallallahu told us, this is our askar. The way that he showed us, this is our way. 
We are not Qadriya, Naqshbandiya, and this Andiya, and that. We are Muhammadi in the way of our dhikr. We follow the way of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa And we say this is the best way of dhikr. And this is the way of the Sahaba radiallahu anhum. We don't need to innovate jumping and sitting and going upside down. And there is a blue part and a red part and a green part and all this little botany stuff that they come up with. Did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa show you that? No? Khalas, we don't need it. Jazakumullah khair. The Bataniya and the Ismailis and others, they didn't believe in Qiyamah, the Day of Judgment. They didn't believe in Jannah and Jahannam. They believe the souls just pass on. They transgress from body to body. They do not believe in Malaika. They don't believe in the message of the Rasul of the Prophets. And they believe, as the people of Kalam, that the philosophies of Aristotle should be used in understanding the Batin. The famous scholar Abu Hamid al-Ghazali, he was with the Bataniya for a while. And when you study his life, he actually went with them and practiced with them and sat with them for a good amount of time. And after understanding their evil, he refuted them and authored an entire book about the evil of Bataniya. And he tore them up in that book and exposed them from their own writings and their own sayings and proved the kufr upon them. As Shaykh al-Islam Taqiyuddin ibn Taymiyyah, when he was asked, he said, they are kuffar according to the ijma of the Muslims. The Alawis, the Duruz, the Ismailis, the Bataniya, Ibn Taymiyyah said, they are kuffar bi ijma al muslimin Now, some of our brothers, they tell us that they are Imma and they are Walil Amr, and they are Khulafa, which is amazing. Because how can somebody like the Alawi, I read in their own writing, they said, Na'udhu Billah, that when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa went on Isra al-Mi'raj, when he went on Isra al-Mi'raj, na'udhu billah, we ask refuge, they have no dalil, this is kadab upon Allah. But they say that Allah's hand, na'udhu billah, had the ring of Ali. <laughs> and they say in their own poetry, they said that when Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa went on the Mi'raj, and he saw Allah, and he came back and he saw Ali, he told Ali that you are here and you were there. Na'udhu billah. Na'udhu billah min thalik. So Shaykh al-Islam Taqidun ibn Taymiyyah says they are kuffar according to the ijma of the Muslims. It is not permissible to eat their meat that they slaughter nor to marry their women not to agree when they do not. They do not. He's saying about them they do not pay the jizya. They are murtaddin. They are murtaddin from the deen of Islam. They are not Muslims. They are not ahlul kitab or ahlul dhimma. They are not Yahud or Nasara. They do not agree with the five time daily prayers being fard or the fasting of Ramadan being fard or Hajj being fard. They do not regard haram that with Allah made haram or his messenger made haram from the, from the meta, from the dead meat or from the khamar or alcohol. He wrote about them. The fact is that, the group, that these groups, the Bataniya and all their sects are kuffar is something that concerning which there is no khilaf amongst the Muslims. Rather, whoever doubts them being kuffar is a kafir like them. What does he say? Abu al-Abbas, Taqiyuddin, Ahmad, Ibn Taymiyyah. That whoever doubts that the batani or kuffar is a kafir like them. And it's not me. Tomorrow you're going to be seeing brothers saying, Uthman made takfir. I'm not making takfir. I'm quoting to you what Taqiyuddin Ibn Taymiyyah said. So, this will be the end of who we study today. I want to end with a very important, or two very important pieces of advice. The first, don't take this as entertainment. There are places in our city that follow this aqidah. There are Boris and there are Ismailis and they have, they have uh, temples, I'm not going to call them masajid. And we have leaders of our Muslim community that go there and give talks and hold hands with them and take pictures with them and sit with them and call them their brothers. And when we mention these things, brothers tell us, don't say names, don't, no, no, it's okay, it's okay. But it's not okay. We have to stand for the aqidah of the kitab and sunnah. And we have to take a strong stand. And those of us selling their iman for money and for popularity and because they're afraid should check their iman. Secondly, these aqaid, 
I believe that whoever follows them or promotes them knows they're wrong. It is just not possible for somebody, forget about a mu'min or a Muslim or somebody on huda, just aqil, like somebody with basic intelligence to follow things like this. And that tells me that the path of right and wrong are clear. Whoever wants to follow the haq will have to take the hardships with it. But the haq is clear. And whoever wants to follow the batil, the pleasures of dunya will be with it, but the batil is clear. These Qadianis and Ismailis, today they enjoy welcomes at the Senate and at the Congress. They enjoy warm regards in European countries. They enjoy special benefits with leaders in different parts of the world. They get invited to the Queen and Dalai Lama sits with Aga Khan and, and Prince Charles flies specially, doesn't even go on a visit to visit the country's president specially to Aga Khan's house because this is the people of dunya. And the people of Zuhud and the people of Akhirah, they are struggling across the world, sitting in jails and hardships. So the two paths are clear, everybody has to choose. But be very careful to stick to the right path. A little bit of temptation towards the wrong, and you will see that it's like a, a snowball that, that rolls and becomes into a, a great amount, an avalanche. So, when you have the choice between right and wrong, ask Allah for istiqamah on the right, and always strive to just stick to the truth. If you know something to be the sunnah, don't care what anybody thinks, follow it. If you know something to be haq, don't care what anybody says about you, they can make fun of you, they can talk bad about you, they can call you uh, a ninja because you're wearing niqab or, a, or backwards or an old woman because you're wearing a hijab, but stick to the truth. They can call you old because you have a beard or they can say you are, your pants are short, you're flooding or whatever. They can say, let them say what they want. They said worse to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa We stick to the kitab and sunnah wherever we are, whenever we are. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala give us that istiqamah. Jazakumullahu khairan.